So, hi. My name is uh, Wienke Giesemann. I'm the co-founder and initiator of the Things Network. Uh, thanks for, for being here uh, in this amazing room. And I uh, just want to start off with a, with a great hand of applause to Mark, Emily, and the team for pulling this off. It's, I think it's super awesome. So um, we started, uh, Johan and I, um, uh, we started the Things Network um, now a bit more than four years ago. Uh, and um, uh, and what's, is this going well? Oh, it's just this screen is blinking. Okay. So, um, and I was talking with Mark, I was like, what should I tell? I was last year, I was already at the Things Conference UK, and he said, yes, it's going to be a very diverse group of people, people that know the Things Network from the start and people that are just joining in. And that's really typical for the IoT market, right? It's growing 100% every year. So every year you have at least half of the people that are younger and f familiar with the concept for uh, less than a year. So um, I tried to do a different kind of talk where I just tell a bit about the basics, about what we do, and then I try to touch upon uh, a few things we've learned across the last four years. Like uh, Internet of Things, and especially the hardware part of this, can be a very... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, a very harsh environment to do business in and to operate and to, um, to, to execute your, your objectives and your goals. So I thought maybe just to share a bit about like, how we do our business and, and how we uh, kept our heads above, above water in this, in this harsh market for four years. So this is a bit what I'm going to talk about. So for the ones that don't know, this is, this is how we started. Um, uh, it is now four years ago with a, with a crazy idea when we saw this lower one technology and we saw there was a protocol that allows you to build open networks and networks of networks. So basically you can do an internet and uh, we went to a little meetup and we said uh, our mission is to build a decentralized and open crowdsourced IoT data network. Uh, there was like not more than 30 people. Uh, and then we, we, we had an even smaller group that wanted to engage in a project where we would set a few gateways in Amsterdam and, um, and, and made sure that we, we made, made this network. Um, and, and the idea was for us that we were very excited about technology from our, or let's say from a technocratic point of view, but we didn't really know how to make a business or make it sustainable or to uh, execute our goals uh, sustainable. So we thought, let's just get started and we'll see how crazy things can get. Um, so it got a bit more crazy uh, to today where we, this network spread out to uh, around 140 countries. We have now 9,300 gateways across the world and we have uh, uh, 68,000 registered developers and we're routing around 10 million messages every day. Uh, and this is, uh, this is increasing and it's growing at a steadily, let's say, 70 to 80% year-on-year growth. Um, um, and um, what I want to go and touch during this talk is, is, is why is this growth, first of all, so stable and sustainable, and how do we sustain ourselves? Um, so the, the, the first hypothesis was, um, it was, was around that like if we make sure that a lot of people can embrace this technology, this open technology in an open way, you have a lot of developers that work with the technology, then somehow they will come up with all kinds of great ideas, but also they come up with new problems you can solve. And if you have problems, you can solve them, and at some point you can charge somebody for solving the problem, uh, and at some times you can make sure that you create a platform out of that solution and then you can go to more sustainable uh, business. So their first idea was, so let's make sure that we enable a lot of developers. And it was really from, we're, we're developers ourselves, and this was really from like how we naturally saw that things happening in the cloud world with SaaS and open source. Um, uh, and also, so, so, so not only these business incentives, of course, but also the idea that um, there's such a strong technology as LoRaWAN should not be limited 
by business models that are forced top down. That's the ecosystem should decide that, you should let it go, and uh, then uh, uh, the, the ones that really create the value will determine what the business models are. Um, so, so looking now after four years, like one of the coolest things, of course, uh, is, the, is to see that actually the technology is actually being applied in production environment, actually creating value, creating business value, creating societal value, anything else. So, so this is one use case. Uh, it's a connected cow. We're going to connect 10,000 cow, cows in New Zealand. You have very large farms there. Uh, they don't have fen and fences, so you want to know where they are. You want to know if, for instance, a cow is pregnant. Very simple use case. If a cow is pregnant, it starts moving differently, uh, and then you can uh, act, uh, act on that and, and guide, uh, guide to the, the birth. Um, this is in farming. Uh, this is a use case. I really like this concept. This is done by Ernast. Ernast as a company from Slovenia. And they started experimenting with a scientific use case where they put uh, sensors on green sea turtles. And um, what they did there is that they, um, uh, they help scientists to track them when they come on land. And they have to fill in a lot of uh, information, but also they have to be on watch to see when they come, uh, come there. So that you can make their life a lot more easier if you can track them. So, um, so it's very nice. Use case were a very, very nice purpose as well. But if you've done this, and you're from the maritime industry, and then somebody uh, that is in the, in the maritime industry would say, hey, if you're able to track a green sea turtle, right, uh, then you might also be able to solve my problems as well. And there's this, I think, very nice synergy between uh, doing something like this with the where you maybe have a higher feel of purpose, and then it can also convert into business, which actually will, able be, 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 uh, will be something that was, is able to fund your business or be able to make your activities sustainable. Um, this, is, uh, this is a project from uh, Japan. Um, uh, they measure the radioactivity across the country. There's a group called SafeCast. It's a citizens group that got uh, created after the Fukushima disaster, and they make uh, maps of the country where people can see where the radioactivity levels are, are uh, high. Um, and, and some of these sensors also work over the Things Network, also pretty cool uh, use case. Um, this is a more commercial use case that we, we do, um, but it's, it's also very interesting to see how the dynamics uh, work in this market. Uh, this is uh, the German railway organization, and we're helping them building an IoT network on every railway station. And um, uh, and the first use case is about syncing the clocks. And what's interesting is that that in a traditional market, you will go to a very large SI, and they will charge a lot, a lot of money, um, totally over engineer a solution. Uh, and, uh, and, and I have it here. Now you see there's more accessible technologies like LoRaWAN, like uh, open and better platforms that allows their, their internal IT department to make it themselves and they, they can really do it at the fraction of the cost. So for them it's also uh, very interesting. Another interesting for the German railway organization as well is that they have way more problems uh, that can be solved by IoT than they have developers. Right? Developers are scarce around the world. So for them, it's really interesting to open up uh, and to make sure they are very public about this because the more great ideas they can gather to solve their problems, the more value they will create. They're not interested in building IoT. They're not interested in building IoT companies. They're not interested in building IoT IP. They're interested in their problems to be solved. And I can assure you, when you're in railway, there's a lot of problems you can solve with IoT. Um, now, so this is what happens. So when the German railway organization uh, uh, sees an opportunity, the Dutch railway organization follows. Um, this is an interesting use case because I, uh, it has some kind of uh, a top line uh, 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 growth benefit. You see a lot of IoT use cases that 
get their benefits from bottom line efficiency. But this is a new stand in Zurich. Uh, and it's a lower one enabled new stand and it measures when the free papers are uh, when they're out, right? So the business model of a publisher works on exposure. So as an advertiser, I pay to how many uh, newspapers you spread. If I see that I have, I'm selling no at some places in the city, I know I have to refill and I can extend my exposure and I can increase my uh, top line profit. Um, so it's a, uh, I really love this case because it's not only about cost saving, but in this case it's also about um, just pure uh, uh, increasing your, your revenue. Um, this is a really nice one. Uh, this is a, a company that's uh, measuring the soil moisture uh, and measuring, measuring the saltiness. Uh, the world is in a water crisis uh, and, um, and, and, and uh, typically beer is the first target. Beer is, uh, is made uh, from hop and hop uh, needs a lot of water uh, and actually beer companies are investing in this uh, kind of technology because the water crisis will hit the beer industry uh, first. And, um, and what it does, it measures the, the water uh, across the field and then it lets you, uh, be, uh, lets you irrigate the field uh, more granul granul on a lower granularity level and that way saving water, uh, uh, increasing yields. Uh, and, and yeah, I really love this one as well. Um, so this is, uh, for, uh, this is a use case we do for our co customer we work. We work sells desk space. When you have desk, you need meeting rooms. You, uh, uh, you make a lot more money with a square meter of real estate where you do desks than with a meeting room, and meeting room is overhead. Uh, if you see that you, your meeting rooms are actually uh, not used that much, then you can convert that space to desk space and then you can increase your revenue. Very simple use case. Um, this is a no-brainer business case, uh, but uh, yeah, used, uh, used a lot, and they're not the only one doing that. We have a few more customers that do that. Um, love this one as well. Uh, and this is a use case from uh, New York. It's called HeatSeek, and what it does, it places sensors in, the, um, uh, in social housing uh, uh, they have in Manhattan, and the social houses are commercially managed. Um, uh, and the landlords, they have to obey to certain rules. So a very simple rule, in the winter, uh, it has to be more than 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, very simple rule. Um, but if they don't comply, filing a, uh, a complaint is very hard. So they automated this by putting in these temperature sensors and now they're tracking all the violations of the landlords of the social housing uh, and is being automatically uh, applied. Um, yeah, something very cool. And I, I think this is also, if you look at this, these areas of social housing or, or even commercial, these uh, private dwelling units, housing, there's, there's a lot of IoT potential because this is just one, but you can think of a lot of other parameters that you want to know about housing. Uh, that have to do with maintenance or anything else. Um, yeah, so this also this very simple use case um, in in countries where you have uh, electricity uh, in uh, on wooden uh, that are distributed through wooden poles, uh, not through wooden poles, but utilizing wooden poles. Wooden poles. Uh, you don't want them to fall over. Uh, so uh, this is a company made a sensor that is just measuring how far it wiggles, and if it wiggles too much, it's probably tending to fall over at one point, and then you can replace it. Uh, of course, you're saving a ton of costs that come with an outage. So, um, so, so, so this whole hypothesis of enabling an ecosystem, uh, and of course, we're not the only one that's trying to enable uh, LoRaWAN developers, but seeing how, what kind of innovation, what kind of business value was created through this, uh, was was really nice and and also uh, what it did is that uh, a lot of companies came to us and they said yeah can you also solve this and can you also solve that um, and we created uh, a company next to the Things uh, Network and it's called the Things Industries and where we focus on the zero to ones to get you started with the Things Network our focus is on one to many 
uh, with the things industries and you see a lot of different challenges then come to play because making a very like a simple one sensor on the back of a green sea turtle is a very different thing than distributing tens of thousands of sensors uh, that can be installed very cheaply. So, so the, the, the first, first hard to scale feature is security. Uh, so we offer a lot of services in that. Um, uh, and, and we do a lot of fe uh, other features in provisioning, but I'll get to that later. And resulted in a quite a large customer base that we're now helping all around the world. Uh, and well, what's, what's really nice as well, and I think th 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 that's also what you saw in this picture, but also what you saw in all the examples, is that LoRaWAN is cracking a lot of different nuts. So actually, the validation of LoRaWAN is also in the fact that the application is very, very broad. It means that actually there's a platform where you can do a lot of different things on uh, 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 and serve a lot of different use cases and businesses. So, uh, so much for the, uh, the introduction. Um, uh, and, um, and, and of course, um, uh, you see me on LinkedIn posting happy thoughts and uh, smiley faces and rocket launches. And uh, that is just for the outside, for you to think that it's really easy. Yeah, it's not, right? It's, uh, it's not a fairy tale. I wouldn't say it's a nightmare, right? But uh, um, uh, it's not for sure not a, not a fairy tale. So I, I, I wanted to share a few thoughts here and maybe some provoking and um, uh, try to keep it, uh, keep it decent. Um, but let's, uh, let's jump in. So, uh, just give you a bit of the, uh, let's start with strategy. So this is gonna be random, right? So it's very not connected random stuff that, uh, that, just, uh, that just came to my mind uh, this weekend. Um, so, so, so let's start with strategy. I like his framework. This is Michael Porter. Anybody here in the room did an MBA or did anything with business and administration in college or university? Michael Porter is, uh, is one of the, the major professors in business and administration. And uh, one of his last pieces is actually about IoT. Um, and, um, and, and he tells about IoT, how you can take it step by step. And actually, every step has a bit of a different paradigm, right? And as, as he also says it, 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 it guides mostly large corporations through how you can create value uh, with uh, small steps. And what it says, it says, it, get, it gets the, uh, it uses the example of the John Deere tractor. Uh, probably most of the people that are IoT know that example of the, uh, the John Deere tractor, but they used to start s selling products and then they made them smart. So they gave uh, a, um, a, a tractor an iPad and they could, then the farmer would go at home and then he saw, okay, this is what my tractor did. This is the equivalent to the do the Fitbit, right? Fitbit, by average, act, ends up in the kitchen drawer after three months. Because it, it's, it's, it quantifies, but after being told uh, three months, every day that you didn't do any running, right? So that's what I knew. Right, so now it's more explicit, right? And maybe I learn some new things. Oh wait, like cycling to work actually is something that contributes to your fitness. Yeah, okay, but then you have that data point, you have the conclusion, and then actually the Fitbit becomes irrelevant once you, yeah, uh, uh, detected your behavior. Then, uh, so there was one step, and then they, uh, they started to, to connect it and they were able to analyze all the data, and they also started to have a commercial relationship, yeah? because if you have it connected, maybe there's some kind of subscription or even a login to a platform. And, um, and then they found out, hey, these farmers are good at farming, uh, but they do it like they you do it already uh, for 100 years, but they're not so, re not so good at maintaining their equipment, because that's not what they, that's not their core activity, right? Like when, when they go out, when they, when, they, when they know they need to go out. They, so, so they came up with this idea of, 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 of moving the tractor, and it's of course a, a known story, from, from buying them to leasing them and giving them 
a uh, operational lease contract um, and pivoted the business model to, to, to uh, and then they, they said, okay, there's one deal here, right? So you do the farming and we do the tractor. That there's where the line is. And, and I'm not going into all the societal discussions that go around that, but this is what happened. Um, and then they thought, okay, but we have more than tractors. Like we have planters, tillers, combine harvesters. This is literally just a copy and paste. Wow, now this like innovation payoffs start to become exponentially interesting because you already did all your uh, capital expenses for uh, and all your R&D for the other thing. And then the next step is to like, how does this IoT system fit into a larger amount of systems? Like, how does this fit in a more integrated approach to anything else? So, how does IoT fit into weather forecast? How does it fit into robotics? Like, now we have this data, we have a, a functional component with APIs. How do the APIs interact? What could a weather system contribute to this system, or do I need some kind of nerve, like central nerve system to connect it. So, just taking it to Laura Wen with a very simple example. It was a company selling mouse traps. One euro a piece, simple, simple business model. Uh, spring takes three years, I have to buy a new mouse trap every three years. Then, um, Somebody come up with the idea to, to make it smart and, um, and, uh, and, and connect it. Um, so then you could, could know what it is. Then somebody connect it to a central system. Uh, so uh, then you have a notification. Uh, then all of a sudden now uh, there starts to business case start to work because you used to have a very large field force that would check mouses and mouse traps. And now all of a sudden you only have to go to the mouse traps. Actually, you have a, a mouse in them. So now the business work really starts to work. So the, yeah, your innovation is paying off slowly, but it's now starting to significantly ramp up. And the next step uh, is that, okay, but in this facility management uh, area, we have other, also other steps. We also have first aid, first aid kits and they, at least in the Netherlands, they have to comply to some kind of worker's law, uh, and they need to have a certain fill rate. So if somebody touched it, right, I need to refill it. But everybody knows that there's only one first aid kit that's being used in the whole building, and the other one is just catching dust, right? So why don't we put a sensor in it? We don't have to even uh, walk to the... So then, of course, you have t 10 of these uh, use cases in a smart building, and then, like, how could that interact? Of course, it integrates with your field force uh, uh, system, so it inter interacts directly. But maybe, yeah, and someday we can we can make sure that robots do this kind of work. So, what I'm trying to show here that it's it's not it's not just this like big dream, but you you you, you gradually go there, and there's also f like a path of acceptance of this digital transformation. So it's not like if you're selling IoT, if you're, if you're going into this market, um, you're, you're up there and they're like somewhere here and, and, and take them step by step. And this is a very nice framework. Um, it, the, the whole article is very long article. It's from the Harvard Business Review. Just Google Internet of Things HBR Porter. You'll find it. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's very nice. And also what it says, it's like there's no, there's no killer app. Um, it's killer ecosystem of sensors, right? So, so, so that's where it goes. And, and, and that's what the story is as well. It goes to killer ecosystem of sensors, and then it goes to an ecosystem of systems where you have all kinds of other stuff as well. Okay, not a random idea. Ideas are worth almost nothing, uh, especially in IoT, it's about execution. See a lot of the same ideas, yet not everybody is succeeding. This is the biggest example. Blockbuster was way earlier with anything called streaming, advertising streaming, uh, uh, single, uh, single uh, movie rentals, subscription services, yet Netflix succeeded in it. It has, it has nothing to do with the idea of streaming. It has to do with execution. Um, uh, yeah, we see it in the market uh, uh, a lot. And, 
Um, yeah, you see a lot, a lot of companies that, 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 that hold too much to their own idea uh, and not able to, to either pivot or be lean about it, they, they fail very fast. Okay, so this is a large market. We're talking about semiconductor companies. Like typically, if you look at the technology providers in your technology stack, there's like a bunch of uh, billion dollar companies. That's all. If you're looking at where IoT is gonna generate significant revenue, you're talking to larger companies. So chances are you're gonna deal with larger companies. And uh, I like to have the metaphor of if you're a small company that you're a flamingo dancing with elephants, an elephant is a very nice metaphor. Like it's, it's like, it looks so cute, yeah? But it has these big teeth as well, right? So, it, so it's, it can be, um, and, 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 and if they start to run and, and you're doing your little dance here, then, um, yeah? And the flamingo as well, right? Like it can do marvelous thing. I don't know if everybody, anybody see, there's this BBC documentary dedicated to the flamingo. It's on, uh, I think it's on Netflix. Have a look at it, it's really wonderful. But um, yeah, it cannot take a lot of a beating, uh, a flamingo. So, um, uh, the, the, so, so, so this, is, uh, this is the metaphor. Um, once you're also talking large co uh, 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 companies, there's always a person, and that is called the innovation manager. And the uh, innovation manager is a, is a, is a nice, woman or a nice uh, guy and the innovation manager, the, he landed himself a job or herself a job and, he, and, then, and then he pitched this idea, we need an innovation manager. He only forgot one crucial thing is to also ask for a budget. Doesn't have a budget, right? So, um, and, um, so if you're four years in this industry, you, you're, you're, you're starting to build up a, a, um, a, a emotion, let's say, <laughs> towards this kind of uh, corporate roles. Uh, and I think this picture is, is it, right? It's, it's nice, um, like he's not gonna fly, nobody's gonna like, let him fly for sure, right? So this is a bit of that, uh, that person. So, and I was, I was in, a, in a room uh, of 20 innovation managers of one single company. So it was a large company, but that company had 20 innovation managers. So, uh, and I was doing a similar talk on, on like how to do business in IoT. And after that, that, um, that uh, there was questions, and the first question was, and somebody said, I said, yeah, all, of, all these great ideas, but how do you make the organization accept? So I said, every month, your bank account is increased with a certain amount of value. And the reason that happens, because you are asked to solve that question, right? I'm just here on stage as a startup. So you should know that answer. Uh, oh, okay, she did, uh, didn't have the, the answer, but I said, okay, l l let's then give my perspective on this, is that if I look at a large organizations, there is actually energy flowing people moving from A to B, it's going somewhere, in roughly two occasions. When someone, something is on fire, you see people running away. And when somebody comes in new, with something new and shiny, you see people running that way, right? So here is an energy delta, so try to leverage this, right? So, um, uh, so either set something or fire, fire, uh, fire or, or, or show something very, very shiny and new that is, yeah, uh, exciting. So just going into the details, uh, so don't talk to the innovation manager, talk to the business directly, that's one. Um, understand what the personal objectives and the company objectives is. So the problem with the innovation manager, his objective is to present the innovation, right? And then he cannot go to, cannot go to the next shiny thing. Uh, so this is not where you want to land, right? You don't want to be in this bucket of innovations that are being presented. You want to talk to the business that is actually going to use your technology. Uh, understand the company's rhythm. So some companies are really focused on quarterly, quarterly results, some more on yearly results. Um, 
um, d d know where the headquarter is and what kind of holidays they, the whole company in the end uh, follows uh, can help you a lot. Um, when you wor work with large companies, sometimes you have to jump hoops, right? You have to comply to processes that, 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 that are irrational or that don't, don't, like, don't feel right. Um, but sometimes you have to do it, but also know when to push back. Uh, and pushing back is uh, uh, because, uh, in the, yeah, in the end, you don't, uh, you want to have a, have a good relationship. Pull, uh, pull risk forward, so think ahead, even forward than, even further than your main contact does, because you're doing all these investments, and most of the times you don't get any revenue up front, so you are the one that is investing your time, so make sure that you really know what kind of hurdles are ahead and try to figure that out and make that explicit as well. So I think one thing we've learned is just say, okay, what's, what's, what's between now and us doing business in half a year? What's, like, what's the step? What's the roadmap? How are we gonna get there? Uh, make it very, very concrete. Um, rec respect each other's strength. So, um, uh, and, and, and also, um, so, a large company can bring the skill, uh, has most of, the, they have more time for their pro processes, they, they have more lead time as well. Um, small company doesn't have time, small company has a lot of, that is one of the most scarce resources of a, of a company, um, and also make that explicit and say, okay, hey, let's, let's make sure that we leverage each other's also in a process. Um, yeah, and, and make all these things explicit. So. So the, the most stupid thing I think you can do is play a game uh, because that will end in, in tears. Anyhow, just constantly make explicit what the risk you are, but also don't forget the process risks, right? Don't only talk about the risks of the final deployment, but also the risk to go there. And uh, in, uh, in the end, that's these, these, that's these open and transparent conversations make the most uh, uh, sustainable and long durable relationships. Okay, and last but not least, never ever do a free proof of concept. We've done so many and we got so little. Like this is just main business. This is something that, that, that it's like you, if, it's like no, nobody's gonna get fired because of a failed proof of concept, right? This is, it doesn't hold value. It doesn't create a vested interest. Um, you don't have to ask somebody else in the organization to do it. Like never, ever do that. You may be, do a PUC that's not profitable, but never ever do a free proof of concept. Okay, another thing, it gets worse before you get, it gets better. So on this ask, X, hey, this is fancy, right? This uh, X is uh, cost per unit, and this is uh, volume. I'm talking about IoT devices. So your first batch of little Arduino thingies, it's gonna be nice, gonna be a few euros. Then you 100, it gets hard. Thousands is very, very bad. 10,000 to 100,000, you get the uh, economies of scale working again. So um, we physically, uh, let's say, experience this because uh, I think most of you know we, 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 we did a Kickstarter of a uh, hardware product and we started off, and, and it was really a crazy idea. So we thought, nah, let's see, maybe we'll just stay a bit here, and it's gonna be a nice developer device, and then it's gonna be okay. So we, 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 we launched the Kickstarter, uh, a hardware crowd uh, funding of a gateway four years ago, and actually, it became a success, and it made us end up here, right? So you, have success, you get a little nightmare, right? So this is, this is, so this is, uh, this is, um, uh, and, and so we ended up with a thousand units we needed to create. Actually, if you talk about units, it was, uh, I think, uh, hardware units of three different product types, uh, I think around 5,000. Uh, but it was also different products, so we had three products here. Right, so, um, uh, and, and, and you have to uh, take that into account. And this is, 
this, uh, this is hard to explain to a customer because, oh, you just built this POC for like, you just did this in a day. Why, why, what's the problem? No, no, it, it gets harder. Why does it, oh, sorry. I, just, I, I go to another point why hardware is hard, but just know that this is the economics with building hardware sensors that are custom. Um, so this is a, a, a graph. Um, yeah, so uh, no, it is, I'm not going to ask what you think it is, because that's stupid. So it's the world population versus the amount of developers on the earth, right? So he, who here is able to write lines of code and make a program run? Okay, cool. Who here works for the government? <laughs> okay. Look at these people, they're your future GDP, right? They're gonna save your country. So, uh, so, so first thing, grow it, right? Make sure you grow it. Um, the, 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 um, uh, you can either do it, of course, education, I think there's a lot of programs, so Claire is here, hi. She's done, done, doing a great job on doing educating uh, girls and boys about uh, IT. Uh, but, but educate, grow it, uh, make sure you have, like, basically this is a, a societal task, right? Make sure you have immigration policies that allow uh, companies to, to have skilled worker immigrants uh, and, and get, them, uh, get them over, and, and, but grow it, grow it. Um, increase impact, um, so increasing impact, so how, how, like, how can we make, make sure that we, sh we solve this uh, developer scarcity is make sure that we use the right tools. Uh, Jan Jongboon is gonna tell about uh, some awesome tools about AI later today uh, and, and saving them tons of time. This is something we're trying to do as well, right? We're trying to reduce the, 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 the amount of work that it takes to build an uh, IoT solution and run it at scale. Uh, diversify, so we have this small group of people that's made the blueprint of tomorrow. The craftsman is gonna leave his fingerprint into the end result. This has to be a, a, at least a certain reflection of society in this small, small, small group of uh, creators. Uh, very important. Don't waste your time, so there's probably more project manager, IT project managers and programmers in this world. Yeah, so IT project managers, you, it's your duty to not waste their time, right? Very so important. Um, and this is also the reason why there's so much I, IT and, and community around the world because of this scarcity. It's also the reason why there is a lot of open source because it's the most simple, best distribution method of code. Right? It's the simplest way to get your code in the world and to make it have impact, right? So, um, yeah, open source is, is, is one of the solutions to, to, to do that. And open source has a lot of different purposes. And uh, if you're an IT company, you think nowadays, definitely with a bullish market, uh, you, you, you want to open source because you want to attract developers. What's next? Okay, IT is IT. Um, there's a lot of marketing that makes you think that IoT is telco. It's not. It always ends up in some kind of IT infrastructure, in some kind of application, and it's almost always an add-on to an existing process or an existing system. Right? It never, barely ever comes out of the blue. Right? So with the mouse traps, it comes directly into the field force management system. Um, Ali. Uh, uh, later today from Coolzone will tell something about uh, um, uh, temperature monitoring and they feed in that into processes of food compliance. So it's always an add-on. So if it's IT, you're selling it to the CIO. So if I'm selling to the CIO, what's the common denominator? If you look at agendas of CIOs across the world, there's are three points. First of all, security and privacy, right? It, 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 luckily, we've come that far. No vendor lock-in and predictable and accountable costs. So, of course, they, then they have like domain and company-specific agenda points, but a good CIO has these three things. 
So, um, uh, um, so if IoT is an extension of IT, then you need to be able to integrate. And that's why our product vision goes around a lot of APIs, open, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and we created an architecture around our product that makes sure that every function is exposed to an API. So either it is monitoring because you want to build your own billing, maybe it's because you already have a login and single sign on LDAP and you can plug that into your identity server. Um, maybe you already have your own, uh, own key management. May, most of the time you already, already have your own dashboard. And nowadays when you have SAP or you have maybe um, uh, Salesforce or you're using one of these low-code platforms like Mendix or ServiceNow, then, uh, then, you, uh, uh, then, then, then you need an integrated solution. That's, we're trying to provide. Um, if you look about security, uh, security IoT is hard, can do a whole talk on that, but the basic thing is that if you're using these low power devices, uh, e there's one constraint and you have to make sure that the security keys are in the device before you install it uh, on site. Uh, uh, if, uh, if you want to do it in, in a very scalable way. Um, and, 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 and yeah, my the only thing that I'm, on a, on a general, without going into detail, is that what I always say is that like, any CIO should have, in IoT should ask them two questions about security. Looking at the end-to-end -end security, where's the one end and where's the other end? And during production, who has seen the keys? So these are two questions. With these two questions, anybody can audit a, uh, a IT solution. And uh, because these uh, answers, they will say, okay, this company, this company, uh, yeah, the key is on the outside of the box, so also the mailman. And so it will actually give you a list, which is your trusted domain. And then you can go through party by party, say, I trust them, I trust them, I don't trust them, I don't trust the mailman, I trust them, right? So, and then at least you, you have, this is an exercise you can do in 10 minutes. Anybody can do a security audit. Two questions. Where is the one end and the other end in end-to-end -end encryption? And the other question is, who has seen the keys during uh, 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 creation of the device? Okay. Predictable costs and accountable costs. Um, like this, this uh, I don't know if you heard these stories about an intern did a big data analysis, and now the AW bill is, uh, is 10,000 euros, where it was 1,000 euros uh, last month. Um, that is not what a CIO wants, right? He has a limited OPEX and CAPEX budget, and you don't want to, the CIO doesn't, doesn't want to knock the door of the CFO and say, hey, sorry, bad news. Um, so, so what we try to do with our business models always to make sure that the usage of our uh, software and platform is aligned with how the customer is generating value. Uh, so aligning business models is one. Uh, avoid spikes, so for instance, we work with bundles. Um, so you, you don't wanna end up um, with surprises, right? So basically that's the one thing. Uh, and, and building not enough uh, margin, right? So um, this, I mean, this is general IT business advice, but your customer really wants you to stay alive in the end, right? That is, is, is important to him as well. Okay, next. IoT is not a zero-sum game. So unlike a lot of marketing outings, you see that companies say, okay, IoT is not a service. Uh, uh, they say, okay, it's Sigfox versus Lorwen versus Narrowband to T. They're all solving a different, different problem. And it's very use case specific and context specific to which one works. So lower one is definitely not solving all problems. Sigfox is definitely not solving all, all problems. Narrowband IT is definitely not solving all problems. Uh, where you see, and then you see predictions, uh, you see these graphs, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm just as uh, guilty of sharing this kind of stuff uh, on LinkedIn, uh, and I apologize for that, but you see this graph that you, that you see projection, projection of numbers. And then you see projection of numbers, and then you maybe conclude, okay, then I should go for that technology. That is not a smart thing to do. So 
listen to your customer, map the requirements, what these technologies you have to offer, and then you can do it. And then there are also different markets. So the zero sum game in the sense that, that I truly believe that, that, that they, w they win together, right? So if Sigfox has su successes, then, then LoRaWAN will have success as well because that will inspire. The market is so early. We're talking about so, so, it's such a small market right now. Um, yeah, that going into some kind of like battle or, or a ring fight or like uh, I've been asked many times, like, what, do you want to go on a panel with uh, somebody from Sigfox, someone from Aaron T, and then you can just fight it out. And, and then in the end, like everybody's sitting there, I say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, we're solving like, we're running into safe issues, we're solving it differently, and yeah, we're good friends, and then they're super disappointed because they would have loved to have seen some kind of cat fight or something, I don't know. Okay, hardware is hard. Okay, so this is typically what you have to think about, from zero to one, to having something in the, in the shop, 24 months, you have 75% uh, of the project will fill along the way. Um, the major chunks are design, that's hard. Uh, talking about 20 million people around the world that can do programming, think about half a million people around the world that can do this, this part sufficiently enough to belong to one of the 25%. Um, so this is a, a big problem. Certify, this is um, uh, very challenging as well. The feedback loops are extremely long, so you made a great design, you going into the certification, go back. We had, uh, we experienced that ourselves when we did our Kickstarter project. We went through certification and literally one of the final te uh, tests, we failed on one point and, it, and we were lucky at the time because otherwise um, uh, uh, that would have been a big disaster. We, we could make a very small modification, um, but um, at this point, uh, what we did, oh, this is not working. Okay, so at this point, at the last point, we already, so this, this block was here. So we already, uh, the people that know us, they know that we already created uh, the green, what you call PCBs, we already created them. So uh, we had to redo them, but you can imagine replanning and you're going for low cost, you always have long lead time, so I mean, uh, again, I can do a whole talk on that. And then also don't underestimate the go-to-market, making sure it's in the right channels uh, and that you can sell it. And uh, I think one, one of the other common mistakes that we've seen happening and we did as made as well is that if you're in a shop, it doesn't mean you're gonna sell, right? Being in a catalog doesn't mean you're gonna sell. You have to do market, you have to do uh, a lot of activation to make sure that somebody buys the product. Um, this is, it's, a, it's a problem that we, we've seen uh, more and more. Um, so um, uh, what about uh, taking VC money? So we're, we're, our, our organization uh, and our company is completely self-owned by me and uh, my co-founder, Johan. Uh, but taking on VC money um, is, um, is risky. First of all, um, th there's not a lot of successful IT companies that done, uh, uh, that took VC money. There's a few French uh, companies, big ones that, uh, that now uh, basically, uh, um, yeah, they, they, they run basically on government money. Um, and um, and it, so, so, so first of all, they're not really reluctant to invest. Um, second of all, a VC wants a 24, 5% year on year. And this is also uh, concludes that, that if you see will get ner more exponentially nervous over time because they have this large interest they have to meet. So the first year will say, yeah, grow the market, grow the ecosystem, you have to. And the second year, oh, what's your, like, what's your, how are you gonna make, like, what's the revenue? And the third year, they're really gonna get uh, nervous because 25 and 25% of the traffic, right? Like that gets, start to sack as a, as a quite big return. Uh, and the 25% is on their entire fund, right? So you're gonna be that outlier that actually has to perform way better. And uh, if you're looking at the complete value chain, you still always have this hardware compon component that is driving the gro growth of the rest of the technology stack because that's the limiting factor. It's, it's, it's limiting the growth. So the question really is, is this really that type of high growth market at all? And um, 
well, my advice here that if you're in this situation, then then start the conversation, but like talk talk about this point because it, it, the moment you're going to get into uh, a situation where you, where you where you where you're considering taking the VC money, they will will make sure they protect their downside, and your terms will be be very very bad. So you take the money, but basically you're selling your entire company uh, already. Um, and then look for other ways to sustain the growth. Um, uh, if you look at cloud providers, how, how they're helping startups. If you look at governments, how they're able to help startups. If you're looking at um, uh, uh, smart ways that you can partner maybe with large companies that can give you uh, 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 a little bit more uh, upfront payments. But yeah, look at smart ways to, to do this. Um, Okay, open source with a, with, a, with a purpose, open source. There's nothing more than a tool. It's like a hammer. Like a hammer is good for one thing, two things. Yeah, it's not good for everything. So open source by itself is just a tool. And you, like saying open source everything might be an interesting personal mission uh, to convince the world, which is really nice. But making something sustainable uh, with this is not. So open source with a purpose. Um, so we did a lot of open stuff. We have open source software, we have an open platform, we have an open network, and, uh, uh, and there's all kinds of reasons, but if you, for instance, look at, um, just as an example, uh, because also on this subject we could talk for an hour, um, so just dive into, like, why did we create this open network? And it has a purpose, it's not, it, 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 it has, if we do it open for sustainability, we don't do it open just for fun. Although it is fun, but it's a side effect. We do it uh, for it. So one of the things, open network, if you have all these gateways and people contribute and it grows, it organically creates a redundancy. If I'm in Zurich or in Utrecht or uh, in places, I have a sensor and then where it, everywhere where I am, my sensor, or in Berlin, everywhere where I am, um, my sensor it, it has, has a connection with uh, six or seven gateways. So if one falls out, it doesn't matter. Right? This is how the internet created. If I send, uh, if I want to visit a website in Australia, there's a huge amount, like a huge redundancy in IP routes to that server in Australia. And that is how open system becomes stable through redundancy. But first of all, the uh, second one is security. If it's open, everybody can contribute to security. We have uh, uh, responsible disclosure on all the things we do, and uh, th this is really the only way forward. It's there, like in a growing market, it's always better to fill fast, always. And with security, it's even better. Th th this is this is this is this is hard sometimes hard to 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 explain to to larger companies. But if you're growing, yeah, you 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 wanna you wanna have that security breach now instead of in in two years, because if you're growing 100% a year, yeah, then you're doing actually, you're having a breach with 25% of what you own in, in, in two years. So also here is like you have to fill early. So security, opening up the platform, opening up the, the code will help you and will reduce your risk. Um, um, if you, of course, want to uh, like push the risks to the next guy or women, a woman that gets her job, then of course puts it, puts it to the future, but, right? Um, so no lock-in. Um, this is, comes back to what the C CIO wants. Um, too many CIOs have been screwed over by IT companies that have, oh yeah, sorry, no. Yeah, now our rates are gonna double and the uh, uh, license fee is gonna go up and then you're in a corner. Um, just helps now. Help. I uh, build or buy, so it, it, it allows, company to have freedom of choice of the economics of their solution um, and, and even choice it, then the choice itself is already it's, it's, it creates a lot of trust uh, and sustainable so um, if it falls over somebody can take over like it's not bound to one company it's not it's it's and and of course you can do it like you can do things like escrow and you can have like this very like hard deals where where you gonna leave the IP somewhere and in the end like that that's just like this escrow solution it's just nice for lawyers they don't understand 
that co what code ownership is, and they think that IP is actually something that you can touch and put in a vault or something, right? That's, we're not living in that age anymore, right? So escrows, it's nice, but yeah, I, um, it, it will not save you, right? It's, it's way more interesting to, to make it open. So, so just some random thoughts. Um, I hope you liked it, and, and then I want to conclude with, with, uh, with, uh, with some thoughts is that, so that like, like we're already doing this for four years and right um, like why, why, are we, why are we still doing this like why how, like how do you hold up you know like as an entrepreneur after three years you have this like little dip that you say like uh, you get this identity crisis and like well, why am I here and uh, who am I and this kind of stuff and and, and for us it's 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 it first of all the value creation is super exciting and uh, the, the value creation without us being intervened and, and uh, like without that anybody's in touch with us, but they, they utilize the platforms and the tools we create. Um, the, the, the maturity of the ecosystem, so we see few segments. Uh, Ali from Coolzone will have a very nice talk uh, one of the, in one of these uh, uh, two days about what they do, for instance, in food compliance. We see a few segments that fully utilize this technology and are growing. Um, and, and, and also, one of the unique factors about LoRaWAN is not just the connectivity, it's not just the last mile, it's a protocol that allows you to build a network of sensors and a network of networks, and that's unique. Uh, and that's actually the only unique thing about LoRaWAN, because sending a, a message from A to B, you can do that with a lot of different technologies. But what's, what's nice about embracing this kind of protocol is that what I hope I made clear is that building this end-to-end -end uh, stack and this total solution is so extremely hard and the risk exposure is so high and the chance of failing is so low, you might want to chop it up and make everybody do what they're good at and collaborate, making sure it's interoperable and making sure that on top of that people can build, um, uh, build, build solutions. So, and this is exactly how we started. We created this network not knowing where it would end. And the only thing we, said, we saw is that this is extremely hard and we have to team up and we have to build this thing together. And we ended that video with, uh, you are the network, let's build this thing together. And I think we're here at this, uh, uh, and, and I think this vision never really changed. Maybe we also exploit, uh, are doing a lot, of, a lot more uh, commercial activity, but exactly with this vision in mind. Uh, yeah, and I want, would love to, See you do the same in the next two years, and I want to thank you very much for your attention.